Hello, if you're watching this, it means you're interested in learning about the Cal TPA cycle one and cycle two. As I was going through the process myself, I remember thinking that I wish I had somebody to just walk me through the process without getting too technical about pedagogy and, and all those things and just really give me a 10,000 foot view of, of what is expected. And so that's gonna be the purpose of this video. So I went to National University and you can see here that they gave me a link and they were able to provide me with two, with a guide for each of the cycles and then also templates here. So my first tip to you would be to print out these assessment guides. They're basically going to be your roadmap for how everything goes. So we'll take a look at what it looks like real quick. So for cycle one, it's got this girl here on the cover. Um, this is the latest version. The next tip I would say is follow the rubrics. Okay, there's eight rubrics in cycle one. As long as you do exactly what the rubrics ask you to do, you present a very strong case for getting full points. And so overall, cycle one is all about students. You're going to be really focusing on the class and three specific students. And then cycle two is all about the assessments. Let's go ahead and check out the very first performance guide for cycle one. Okay, so um, you can see here, there's gonna be three focus students for cycle one. So you have a student identified as an EL learner. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Focus student two is somebody with an IEP or a 504 or is gate. And then focus three is gonna be essentially an SEL student, social emotional learning. This is a student whose life experiences need you know emotional support, et cetera. So you're gonna be focusing on the class and then those three students. So this evidence table is really going to be your blueprint here. So step one, plan. Step two, teach and assess. Step three, reflect. Step four, apply. And you can see on the right side here, you've got part A, part B, part C, D, E, F, and G. And these are all the parts you're doing is parts A through G. If I go back to my university website here and I go to templates, you'll see that they are providing me with Word documents of each of the templates. So part A template, part B, part C, part D and E are gonna be things you create and then you have part F and part G. So everything is handed to you as templates and that's what you're gonna turn in to Pearson to be graded. But what you'll wanna know is that there are eight rubrics in cycle one. Okay, there's eight rubrics. And you can see here that each one has a specific goal and the rubrics are aligned, okay? So my understanding is that there's eight rubrics. There's up to five points for each rubric, but you really only need a final score of 19 points total and you're allowed to have one score of one, which basically means you do, you know, you kind of bomb one of the rubrics you're allowed to have one of those and still pass overall. So let's go ahead and go through rubric 1.1 a little bit and I can kind of explain how it works. So you've got five levels here, level one, level two, three, four, five. If you can get threes across the board, then you are gonna pass the Cal TPA. So level three is really what you wanna strive. Two and one, don't even read those. If you wanna get try to get four points, then you're going to do all of level three and you're going to do this stuff here. If you want to get five points, you're going to do all of this, all of this. And then um, level five is really about UDL. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Right. So again, just really striving for everything in level three. If you can get four points, awesome. If you can get five points, even more awesome. And so you can see here rubric 1.1. And if I go to the bottom of rubric 1.1, it will tell me where the person who's grading me is gonna source this. So the first one says here, how does the candidate's proposed learning goal connect with students' prior knowledge? How did the learning activities, strategies, and grouping strategies support, engage, and challenge? So in order for them to grade this and give me a point value, they're gonna look here under sources of evidence, which is part A, B, C, and D. So all of these four parts together they're gonna have an overall sense of how well I met this, and then they're gonna assign me a point, either three, four, or five. Hopefully you don't wanna get a one or a two. So as you go through this, you're gonna see here rubric 1.2, and you can see here where they're gonna source that. Rubric 1.3, you'll see where they're gonna source that, so on and so forth. 
You can see here this rubric 1.5, the only source is gonna be the video clips you're gonna record of yourself teaching. All right, so you've got eight rubrics overall. All right, so let's go ahead and check out some of the templates. So for part A is the getting to know your students template. All right, so this is what the template looks like here. Really, really important is you're always gonna read what's in the green boxes here. They're gonna tell you exactly what to do. I don't know if anybody here has ever done any kind of coding, but you're always gonna type between the brackets here. All right, so the first thing here, it says description of students' assets and learning needs. So what prior academic knowledge related to the specific content you plan to teach? So that's where you're gonna answer this here. Okay, so you make sure you type between the brackets. Okay, and then you're gonna talk about your the English language proficiency levels of standard English and English learners. Okay, so on and so forth. So you've got in part A, um, you've got all of these things here. Um, looking here, focus student one, right? And focus student one, you're gonna call them FS1. This needs to be essentially anonymous. So you're not gonna use names, not gonna use school names, not gonna use last names. You're just gonna talk about them as FS1. Always gonna try to reuse these words here as best as you can, right? They're really looking for academic writing. And you can see here, um, as I go through, the template on its own is already four pages and you have nine pages maximum. You cannot go over nine pages. Some of them don't have a maximum, some of them do. So this is the very first part here, nine pages. Honestly, it's a bit daunting. I think this is actually one of the hardest ones to do, especially if you haven't, if you're not used to the TPA cycle. And what's also really cool is that you can kind of reuse this for cycle two if you do the same class. Let me show you, for example, what mine looks like. And not that I wanna show you exactly what it is, but I wanna show you because one of the things they want you to do I am not a fan of this at all, but one of the things that they really, really wanted you to do was use underlining and bold to, you know, accentuate things that you think are important, right? So you can see here, um, this is one of the standards here, media arts standards. I'm an arts teacher. And so this is the standard that I'm using. And you can see here, um, there's a big emphasis on use of technology, right? Cameras, computers, software, academic English, prior art education. You can see here, I'm accentuating these words with bold. And honestly, I think that this is because the people who are grading this are, I don't know how closely they're reading this. And so this is really gonna help your words kind of stand out as they skim this and go through this. I don't know how many they're grading at a time, but you can see here that my entire document and all of the documents that I do have this bold underline thing going on. Um, here you can see here, FS1 is a first generation immigrant from Mexico, all in bold. That's something that I thought was important to include since they are an EL student. So that's part A, and that's about getting to know your students, right? So part B is your lesson plan template. And this one, let's see if there's a, uh, there's no page maximum. This one can get kind of wild if you're really, really into it. Again, read the green box, go through all this stuff. And again, you're gonna almost regurgitate these words based on student assets. What do you expect students to deeply understand? Let's go ahead and take a look at my example here. Here's my content learning specific, content specific learning goals, right? I had three goals here. You wanna have maybe one, two, three at most. You don't wanna have a bunch of different goals because you have to hit them all. All right, so you can see here, here's that same question, right? Based on student assets, what do you expect students to deeply understand about the lesson? Based on student assets, as identified in the, and this acronym here is the getting to know your students, this is part A, document. I expect students to have a deep understanding that photography is the marriage of art and science, right? So again, utilizing their terms you are going to use that as your sentence frames. And um, my understanding is that you can use this, the GTKYS, you can use this acronym so that you're not writing getting to know your student's document because that uh, yeah, takes up a lot of space. You're gonna be doing that underline bolding thing. One of the things that I wanna share with you is this website, the UDL guidelines. 
It's udlguidelines.cast.org. This right here, I went to this website every single time I worked on my TPAs. This right here is what's going to get you closer to getting five points on your rubrics. And this is an awesome way to talk about your classes. So each one of these are called UDL checkpoints, and you can actually refer to them by the number here. So for example, if you are providing options for comprehension, you can see here if you activate or supply background knowledge, that is called UDL checkpoint 3.1. You can you can use this verbiage here, and you can also use the 3.1. So I'll show you how I use that here. All right, inability for students to provide sufficient answers as a checkpoint for understanding will be caused to model thinking and utilize UDL checkpoint 8.4, increase mastery-oriented feedback to give students instant feedback on their collective answers and demonstrate the thinking process of an artist while viewing imagery. So right here, UDL checkpoint 8.4. If I go back here and I find 8.4, you'll see that that is right there, increase mastery-oriented feedback. So this right here gives you an awesome, awesome kind of framework to look at and pick things and utilize them to help fill out your answers. All right, so part B is your actual lesson plan. So part C is the lesson plan rationale. And basically this is why are you doing the things that you're doing? Read the green box and you're gonna go through and let's see what this is. This is a seven page maximum, okay? And so it asks you about the activities they're doing, your instructional strategies, the kind of grouping that you're doing, right? How are you doing academic language development? You do need to have ELD standards as well as content standards. All right, and as you go through, again, just answering within the brackets, here you've got your focus students. How is what you're doing um, focusing on those three students specifically? All right, so that's, that's part C. I found this one to be pretty easy, to be honest, because after you write the lesson plan itself and you do all of the, um, the thinking behind creating the lesson plan, this one is just kind of comes easy, in my opinion. And part D, you can see here, there's no template, and that's because part D is the resources and materials, right? So part D, I just opened up Microsoft Word, and I created this. And so I made a table. I called it Artifact 1, the resource material. This is just a screenshot of my Google Classroom, the UDL strategy that it goes with. So I chose executive functions. Again, I got that from the CAST website. Okay, you hear executive functions. And you can see here, so justification from student assets and needs. And so I just justify why I'm using it. So you can see here, I used Google Classroom. Here's my bell ringer. All right, look at that. I even had a typo. I still passed, fantastic. All right, here's the quiz that I used. Here's my textbook, All right? Here are some slides from my slideshow. And here is a screenshot of the video that I showed. So you can see here, um, and then also here's the assignment. So you can see here I had seven artifacts. I don't think there's a minimum or maximum, but again, you just wanna make sure that you have um, you know, a fully fleshed out idea and lesson plan. 